Okay, so what I'd like you each to do is just take a moment to introduce yourself and then answer this question, how do you see the market for smart TVs and streaming sticks and boxes or pucks? Uh, how do you see that market today? Uh, and how is that impacting your business? So why don't we start all the way at the end with you, Mehmet. Introduce yourself and what do you do and then answer that question. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Mehmet. I'm the um, CCO of Fox from and Relax TV. And um, yeah, I'm here to answer your first question then immediately, I guess. How do I see it right now? I think we, you know, we had a lot of nice insights today, again, uh, from some great players in our market and industry. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I, I like feel really um, in the middle of this fight for the leadership position within the OS. I think some of our friends in the US call it the TV OS wars, where um, we see a huge fight in between op operators, OS providers, tech companies, wall garden. Yes, better? Yeah. Um, and at the end of, of the end, I think there will be some sort of consolidation happening at some point. We will discuss maybe how far they can go. But for us as a company, it means that, and um, I may echo of some of our friends from earlier, that we believe there is a future for an independent OS uh, that creates benefits for everyone in this ecosystem and value chain. And that's where we see ourselves, and that's what we've been working on the last few years. Very good. Go ahead. All right. Um, OK, so uh, I'm Fahad Rani. I run product for um, uh, Google TV, specifically the content discovery and monetization um, uh, teams. Um, so I'm going to take an opposite position to Mehmet here. <laughs> um, I, I see three uh, key trends. Um, so I think there's going to be um, a lot of competition uh, in the coming years. Uh, I also see that this is going to lead to fragmentation and which eventually is going to result in complexity uh, for the user and for the partners. Uh, when I think about competition, uh, the key thing, if you look at the key primitives, they're all pointing in that direction, right? So I was actually reading um, Mark Andreessen's Substack um, a, few, a couple of weeks ago, and I was surprised to actually see that the category that's dropped the most uh, since 2000 is TV, 80% drop in uh, uh, when you uh, uh, track it against the CPI. Um, which is huge. So, and this is not going to, you know, come back anytime soon. Um, and then the second thing about fragmentation, we, we're seeing already Tizen and others kind of, you know, going into and uh, licensing their OSs to other OEMs, um, which is going to lead to this fragmentation. Uh, and then finally, this is going to add complexity to uh, for the users and the partners. And whoever actually does a great job of actually kind of elevating themselves above this complexity and solving core user problems, I think is going to. Uh, you know, it grabs some market share. And that I think we're going to get to in a little bit more detail in just a minute. But right. first, Nick, please introduce yourself and answer the question. Hey, good afternoon. I'm Nick Rouget. Um, I run the commercial group at Vida, which is a, a spin out of Hisense, the TV manufacturer. And we are an independent TV OS, another one. <laughs> Um, and we, we work with uh, just over 200 different brands globally who use the Vida OS to run their, um, to run their TV platforms. Um, we're going to gang up on you today, I'm afraid, because I'm, I'm on the consolidation side as well, I think. Right. Um, but I think, I think that's the big thing we see in the market at the moment is, is this, this consolidation factor. So fr fragmentation, definitely, but I think we'll get into some of this. This business is all about scale. And so there's an element of natural selection, I think, that's, that's happening already. And you know, if, we, if you think back to the, the previous speaker we just heard from Deutsche Telekom, it used to be the TVOS guys fighting each other. Um, and, we st and we still do. We're, we're, we're partners and, and competitors, all, all of us. Um, but suddenly now you've got operators who've decided they want to be in the TV business, whether they're building their own TVs or whether they're um, whether they're trying to take over the TV like, um, like many operators, um, particularly in Europe. And so, so I think the, the kind of battle lines are being redrawn at the moment, and that's, that's the big dynamic in this space. Yep, yep. Well, this, this issue of fragmentation, I think, is probably one of the defining features of our market today. 
Um, we have, of course, U3, but we also have, well, we've already heard from Sky Glass, we've heard um, there's LG, Samsung, both of which are looking to license their TVOSs to other providers. We've heard from TiVo with TiVoOS. Um, there is Roku and others in the market as well. So it is a very fragmented, uh, um, uh, fragmented situation. So this brings me to, t I want to ask a two-tier question. So I want to ask first, how do you go about differentiating your OS with consumers? And then I want to talk about how you differentiate it with OEM manufacturers. So let's start with consumers. Um, so let's start with you first, Nick Conway. So, so, so I think the, the two parts of the question, I think all of the, the types of features that consumers are looking for and therefore OEMs are looking for when they, when they talk to, to people like us as a potential partner, performance, UI, the right apps, um, the right user experience, the right monetization, all those sorts of things, they've become such table stakes for, for both the consumer ultimately and then those OEMs that... I think the things where we differentiate are much more on the business side now. So the boring stuff like what's the cost of the bomb um, to deploy this particular OS? Um, what type of components do you need to build, build out that, that TV? What are the business relationships like? How do you support us with marketing? How do you support us with retail? Um, and so it's, the, the product stuff's important, but that's, like I say, table stakes. It's the, it's the business stuff that I think is really working out how we differentiate. So I think I heard you say that all, all the OSs are kind of similar now, but the way you, you can differentiate with the OEMs is with business relationships, certainly, and ease of integration, bomb, keeping the bomb cost low. Farhad? So uh, I agree with that, and I'll add a little bit more on top of that. Uh, so all of the above, I think uh, it's no surprise if I say that you know users are primarily making decisions on price, screen size, screen uh, you know a playback quality, etc. Uh, as kind of like the main drivers, and the TV OS or the brand is kind of like a distant fourth or fifth somewhere like that, right? So I agree on that. Uh, but I think of I think about it in terms of phases, right? So that's how it is right now. But if, uh, if you, um, as Nick pointed out, I think about it in terms of go-to-market, in terms of who actually is going to be good at great at execution, helping the OEMs with execution, or for that matter, operators, with global scale support, um, uh, you know, uh, supporting the stack for five, seven years, uh, you know, generally the lifetime of the, um, of the product. And then uh, finally, the business models that the OSs can actually bring along, right? Because that actually goes into, as I mentioned, the second phase, which is that business model is going to fuel uh, the innovation around better socks, uh, you know, uh, better features that eventually can be powered that allows the OSs to differentiate. So as we kind of think about our better together journey, as we call it on the Android ecosystem, that's kind of uh, going towards differentiation as you help the partners succeed allowing them to differentiate on features that actually are differentiating just uh, not, and not just limited to the consumption on the device. Okay, and Mehmet, uh, what, do you, what do you think? Well, I, I also tend to agree with both, but that uh, most of the OSs um, look the same. Um, the UI also has to look the same. Uh, I mean, I addressed that earlier um, as well, is where most of the must-carry applications that we know today, like Netflix, et cetera, have certain sets of requirements that make you do certain things you would maybe not do in terms of UI design, um, as a result, looking the same. Um, premium positioning, disaggregated content, et cetera. So from that perspective, I agree. We all tend to look more alike. However, I think there is from the consumer, because you asked, the first question was, what is the difference for the end consumer, or what can it be? Um, I think what I realized from the market is um, that a huge change has happened. A few years back, the discussion was on the retail floor, do you have Net Netflix or not? Do you carry YouTube or not? I think that is now a commodity. Everybody has to have Netflix in order to be successful in the retail floor. The thing is, the, the two things that I hear today from the OEMs and from the market is speed and UX a little bit of, not a little bit, uh, maybe a lot of what Pedro said earlier, uh, allowing the end consumer to relax, to 
scroll through the UI to find content easily and watch. And if you manage to do that, you give an added advantage to the end consumer. For the OEM, is a bit more dramatic. <laughs> I think the I think the choice of the CTVOS for the OEMs is a matter of survival because we're talking about a horrible hardware market um, in terms of it's a stagnating market. It's been, since I can think of, always around 200 million TVs that are being produced every year, but with an annual price decline of around 17%. So from a business perspective, it doesn't make sense to produce a TV hardware-wise. So what do you do? You focus on that, what brings you the money? And that's at revenue you could potentially get through the shift of viewing time, right? So I think the OEMs need to be very careful um, what kind of OS they choose and for what reasons. Because I think the major point, just like what Nick said, is the uh, cost for it as well as the long tail um, revenue they can generate after the sale of the TV. So this is one thing that I've been tracking pretty closely and as you say the margins on television sales particularly at the lower end well <laughs> lower end is relative right these days um, it, it is it's very very small so let's spend a moment let's talk about these other revenue opportunities um, that, that you bring to opera uh, uh, bring to OEMs uh, and let's explore those a little bit so uh, Farhad do you want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the back-end opportunities that you offer maybe to TV OEM, OEMs when they, get, when they go with Google TV. Um, yeah, do you want to elaborate when you say back-end? I just want to make sure I get the nomenclature right. Uh, I mean advertising, um, you know, s uh, splits with uh, when, they, when they get somebody to sign up for a, um, a service on the box, that sort of thing. Got it. Yeah. Um, so if, when you think about how to kind of, you know, uh, help our partners succeed, and when you think about partners, we're kind of thinking about uh, both sides. We are th th thinking about our OEM and ODM partners, and we are also kind of thinking about uh, our service partners um, who bring in the content. Um, so uh, the key uh, the way to think about it is which uh, platform or OS can actually bring in uh, the reach and the distribution capabilities, because by the end of the day, advertising, as one of my uh, colleagues actually mentioned, is a scale business, right? So the idea here is, well, how can we get you the reach um, uh, that the advertisers actually want? And finally, um, how can this be done at lo lower complexity? So when we're thinking about lower complexity, is like, are the service providers kind of you know using the same binary in all of the uh, d devices that they are actually installed, and so that they don't have to do any specific SDK integrations for any of the monetization? So th those are areas that we are really thinking about in terms of kind of really making it uniform and standardized on our OSs, so that our service partners um, uh, in can integrate easily to the global scaled advertising platforms that Google generally has. Uh, is uh, so whenever we kind of think about we kind of think about platform level support how to kind of serve the ecosystem across the partner uh, partners and then looking at the specific uh, let's call it ad products or ad features that uh, they can then tap into again through the scaled platforms that are already available so it's kind of like a two step process that we have there and to answer your second question which you said what kind of ad products are there it's early days for us but you know all of the standards uh, like you know display advertising uh, including uh, in-stream advertising are uh, available uh, at, the, at the moment. Very good. Nick? Yeah, I, th I, th I think, uh, Vida, we, we realize and, and try and understand that OEMs are all very different um, depending on their scale and where they are. And so, so some OEMs, you know, the, the primary thing they want to work with us on is product innovation. They want to they want to lead. They want to have the best the best product. We have we others that have others that really need help with with retail marketing support, etc. We we have others that want to participate in advertising. Some of them don't want to participate in advertising. They're still very much in the mindset of one off transaction. That's where they want to go. But I think the 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 opportunity for OEMs to come and work with us is one of kind of bigger together. So we can help provide the scale that if they want to get into the advertising and participate in that, um, those revenues long term, doing that on their own is very challenging, but doing it as part of something much bigger um, is, is a real opportunity. So I, I think that's a big part of it. I think, I think we're also, you know, we each play at kind of in different areas of the market. So, you know, Google, Android, we know very successful with, with the telco market, for example. Um, 
we we have much more of a of a kind of I think impact traction with the 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 rest of the OEM brand market. So so kind of numbers wise, if you look at uh, native OS branded TVs, that 200 million that uh, one of my colleagues referenced, about 52% is is native OS big brand Samsung, Tizen, Vizio, etc. But that other 48% of the market is brands that you know we UK is not really an OEM market, right? So we go to retail here and you see Samsung and LG and um, and Hisense. Um, you go into a retailer in Argentina. We wouldn't recognise any of those brands, right? That's that's forty eight percent of the global market that that sometimes gets kind of forgotten. So we're on a mission to kind of empower those guys and and let them participate in this ad space if they want to. So start small and get bigger. Mm. Good mm. strategy. Mm. Good strategy. Okay, I want to talk about something that this is both um, a minefield, I think, for you as TV operators, and also illustrates the power that you have in the interface. And that is how you can really help the content providers that are providing services through those sets in getting their content in front of people. Um, I say it's a minefield. I can tell you that I've had a lot of complaints uh, in my private conversations with SVOB providers about how their content is handled in search results, for example. Where they come, where they come, which store is preferred for pay per view? So let, let's talk about how you're helping the content providers market their content inside of that operating system, and maybe deal with some of these complexities about who gets listed first when somebody's searching for a movie <coughs> and they're looking to rent it. Uh, so why don't we start with you first, um, Mehmet, on that question? Um, well, I'm going to be quite frank about it. It's a commercial discussion. So um, if the service does not belong to us, um, then we need to discuss in a general man man uh, manner uh, how we could help each other. So I know it sounds very direct, but that's how it is. There is a few must-haves you do not talk with in that sense, uh, which have a huge brand value globally. But maybe this question is also in addition to the previous question, what do we want to achieve by offering an OS? An OS is a vehicle to monetize viewing time. So for us, the goal, the ultimate goal is, and all of us have our own streaming services for that particular reason, is to direct as much viewing time into our own services as possible. And in order to make that service more attractive, we have a tendency to speak to content providers to offering them a channel within our services. Because that will give them automatically a higher viewing time than being an app somewhere on some page at some back of the app store or where, wherever it is. So it's a, it's a, you said it's a minefield. Yes, I agree. It's a very delicate road to walk. But it's all about uh, giving distribution to content providers um, and allowing them to benefit from the solution as we want to grow our solution in, in that sense. Because content, yes, it's king. Um, the better the con content, the bigger or the stronger they are to negotiate the terms with the OS providers. And that's not necessarily only valid for us. I think that's valid for everyone. So in the discussions that you have with content providers, one of the things that comes up is, can you give us a channel with, with some of your content that we can provide in, in, um, in, in your FAR service that's native to the box? Correct. Right. Farhad? OK. I'm trying to recall how many times have I answered this question. Probably hundreds of times. Uh, no, I, I, when I see in terms of uh, questions that come from service providers and everything. So um, for us, it's not too complicated. Like, we always go back to first principles. Um, you can go and look up the Google values at the moment. The first thing actually says respect the user, and the first line there actually says user first. Um, uh, we have public uh, help uh, documents available on the help center that literally shows you how our recommendations actually work and which signals we take into consideration. So uh, at this point, the way wh what we're trying to do is like it's all about what the user affinity to a particular content is. 
and everything else comes second, right? Because if you make uh, uh, keep the users happy on a simple level, which means like what they want to see, how quickly they can get into this particular piece of content is what we optimize for. And once you do that, then I believe somebody talk, uh, mentioned something about the 25th hour or something like that. The, I, the, way, the other way to think about it, instead of thinking about it as a 25th hour, think about it in terms of like the time that you're reducing for the user to get into the piece of content. So whatever time they actually have, let's say an average of two hours in a particular geography, if they're spending 30 minutes of that trying to find something, how about spending one minute to find something and getting them straight into that? So our core principles are kind of aligned with how we actually think overall from a user-first perspective, then everything else follows. But I, I you know, when I'm, I'm our primary TV, we use Google, Google TV. Happy to hear that. Pardon? Happy to hear that. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, and actually, I should say, we weren't able to use it until my wife got her favorite service, which is BritBox. I'm, I live in California, so um, we weren't able to get it until BritBox was available on the platform, and it wasn't available for quite a while. Yeah. So I will say that that's a very important aspect. Um, but one of the things that's, that's interesting there is when we do searches, it, it's, there's a couple, you show me a couple of responses, but I have to go right and click on t to see other opportunities. That's a very, pa those two slots, very powerful positions, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes, they are. Uh, but you'll notice that when we give you a search response, the search response at the top is always specifically uh, provided by you know, recommendations from within the apps that you're subscribed to. And we give you some toggles in terms of choosing outside of, the, uh, outside of your subscribers or not. But that's kind of like the key thing. So the important thing was entitlements, right? So we trust, uh, we basically honor entitlements above everything else. And when I may say entitlements, it's basically the user telling us which services that they subscribe to or would want to see recommendations from. So the first two slots that you mentioned, when you actually see what we call the search results page, would primarily be from uh, uh, the providers that you actually have uh, given us entitlements to. Uh, they are valuable. That's where the most, uh, the goal, the idea here is like get that engagement right. That's the whole thing. I'm not saying we get it right all the time. Yep. I've heard, we've heard, I just heard your feedback, BritBox not being in there. So if <laughs> BritBox is not integrated, uh, then you will not see that. And right. we will do the next best thing, which is an equivalent to that or drop you into right. some what we call a backup flow. Uh, but that's something that we are doing. We have over 50 plus providers now fully integrated into Google TV. And our BD teams are hard internationally doing that, not just in the US and other markets. Um, so yes, we, we do uh, get it wrong. I'll be the first one to admit that. But our goal is to kind of keep increasing that bar. I, I don't want to say that you were getting it wrong. Actually, I can give you a great example of where you got it right. Um, we were watching a show called Private Dicks. Very funny, very funny show. Um, the first place that you suggested we watch it was in Freebie. We watched an episode there. A lot of ads. Mm -hmm. Didn't like it. So we did the search again. And then we went right, clicked. Mm -hmm. And it was available in Tubi mm. at a much lower ad load. So we watched it there. Mm -hmm. So that's a success. In, in my book. Okay. Um, I want to turn to you, Nick, on this question. I w do you have a different take on this? I think your, your, your mentioning you had a Google TV was a plug, right, to try and get us to send you a Hisense TV as a, I as a sample. I love you. We'll put, we'll put a VPN on it. You can watch, <laughs> you can watch iPlayer instead of BritBox. Oh, yeah, be better be oh no, no, d oh. don't say that in this yeah. room. No, I, no, I think <laughs> so you, it absolutely is a balance. And so when you get into customer recommendations and search and all those sorts of things and algorithms click in and customer preferences and all that, but let, let's all be honest here. We also have placement opportunities on all of our platforms that are paid placements. And if your check is big enough, you can command a, a share of voice on the on the home screen, etc. And so money money does talk, um, and it creates a really interesting dynamic. So so I have a I have a commercial team that are trying to bring in ad revenues, but I also have an editorial team that their metrics and the way they're measured are about increasing customer engagement, about customer satisfaction that we get from surveys, et cetera. And if you're promoting the wrong content because somebody wrote you a big check, that's a very short-term business model because your customer <laughs> satisfaction is going to slide very quickly. So there, so there is this tension and this dynamic of trying to get that, that balance right. Um, I don't think we, all, we always get it right. Um, I think data is really helpful in some of these negotiations with these, these bigger partners. 
Um, we're also trying to do a lot of things on a, on a local level of making sure that um, local apps, and particularly sometimes public service funded apps, get prominent placement without being in, in a position where they can necessarily write those big checks. So there's an there's something for Simon. There's, so there's a, there's an editorial part to this that I think is equally as important of the, as the commercial bit that you have to try and balance. Right. Um, so there's a there's a topic I'd like to touch on here: voice control. It's come up several times. Voice control and voice search. It's come up several times in the conference, um, and it is a very very powerful tool for discovery. People are using it a lot more these days. Um, so I, I wonder, this is sort of a two-tier question again, how difficult is it for a content provider to plug in to make sure that they're found when somebody uses voice control? Um, so that's sort of the first question. So why don't we just deal, deal with that first? Um, so I think... Uh, you all have voice control, so why don't we start first with you, Farhad, because I think yours is probably the best known. Um, so uh, it is an important user journey, uh, but that's not the only one. The way we think about it is, we always think about the user journey from like, what is the user trying to do? As I mentioned, we're trying to reduce the time to get into the piece of content, right? And they can get into them in many different ways. They can use the button to jump straight in, uh, if, um, or they can actually turn the device on going to the app straight, uh, straight ahead, right? Or they can ask the assistant, Google Assistant that we have on the device. So multiple different ways it can get in there. Underlying the point, as you pointed out, it is one of the important and core user journeys. If user is lost, they can just ask and that can happen. Now, the key question about how difficult is the integration. So we, we have, as I mentioned now, you know, approaching many, many, multiple dozens of partners who are integrated onto Google TV. And all they have to do is, again, a, public, a publicly available set of schema and APIs, um, which, again, is schema.org supporting the ecosystem, uh, which they can integrate with. And the rest of the heavy lifting is done by, um, by, by, by the Google Assistant team, for, for example. right? Uh, it's all they have to do is just integrate the metadata, and the heavy lifting is done, the, the voice, uh, um, uh, grammar, et cetera, and all of that is done by the system. So that's the only thing they have to do. There's no special tuning that happens outside of that. Yeah, Mehmet? Mehmet? Yeah, I agree. It's, it's a very powerful tool. It's, I was actually surprised that it took many years you know, to take off. You know, when we analyzed the, the usage of such, um, it was very low in a lot of countries and a lot of cultures for a very long time. In Asia, they're all used to speaking to their phones and commands for a very long time, so it was m much easier for them to transform to that. But when you look at the experience, you just uh, read the title of a movie you want to watch, and boof, there it is um, in the bouquet of whatever the subscriptions you uh, that you have, I think that can be very powerful. Technologically, um, I have to be careful because I'm not the guy who's developing that, but as far as I see with our team, it's very easy to integrate. You rely a lot on third parties um, to connect to the databases and metadata, but yeah, I'm, I think it, we will see a much better uh, result um, very soon by developing this technology further. Good, good. Uh, can I uh, show of hands? How many people have used voice search or voice control on their TV in the last week? Wow, look at that. That's a, a good. Nick. So, talk to us about Vida and. and um, yeah. So, we, we, I mean, we, this is something where if you if you can't beat them, join them. So we 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 partner with, with Google and we support Google Search in our in our platform. But um, w I think. Yeah, as, as you know, we've we've been trying to metadata integration with content partners is always more of a heavier lift than than just bringing apps on board, um, and so it's something we, you know, m makes a material difference to the customer experience, with us being able to curate and recommend content. But but one of the the other benefits that we always push is the the you know the the benefit of aggregated search. And as kind of you know custodians of content discoverability, as we like to tell our, our content partners, um, people weren't really using that aggregated search until voice became um, much more widely used. I think the other thing we see is people using companion apps. So we have, like most of the um, our competitors, have a, a companion a remote control app that works on, on mobile phones and tablets, etc. And so people are using that to search just because it's easier to type on your phone than it is on a remote control. 
Um, so, so yeah, I think, I think it's definitely becoming more of an important thing. And how do you advise content providers that you're working with to, to bring uh, content onto your platform? How do you advise them about the metadata? Very, very important. I mean, it's garbage in, garbage out. If you don't give me good metadata, you're not going to get found. You're not going to. You're not going to get recommended in the recommendations, right? How do you advise them? Yeah, it's diff diff different. Content partners will have different strategies, and so so some people. Um, I don't think I'm saying anything out of school here. People like Netflix, for example, they want to do a metadata integration, typically where they're pushing recommendations to customers, and they the, so they kind of want access into your platform to be able to push their own metadata and their own recommendations. We have other big global partners that will 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 want us to have a, a effectively a copy of their catalog, so that our content and editorial teams can curate their content and create um, you know, sliders, carousels, whatever, however you describe them, um, based around particular themes, whether it's Valentine's, whether it's you know, movies you might like, etc. And so, so it very much depends on their, their strategy of how they, they support in engagement and, and us being able to, I guess, work in all of those different models. Right. right. OK, we've only got a couple of minutes left. I have one more question that I'm going to ask. I want to know any questions in the audience that we can take for you. This is a golden opportunity to ask these gatekeepers yep. key questions. We have one over there. Oh, hi. Hi, um, I'm independent, but I work a lot with companies that uh, do uh, social interaction, um, and, and mainly in apps, but also moving on to the set-top box and so on. Um, you, you've talked a lot about the relationship between the device and the content providers and, and the OS. What about those type of applications? So uh, a, lot, a lot of device manufacturers are putting cameras back in that allows you to, could allow you to do watch together, uh, all of these things that are coming more and more in terms of social interaction, building a network, um, uh, mutual um, recommendations. Yeah, so building, a, building communities. Um, is that something you see as attractive? Um, okay, Aaron's looking at me. Uh, I'll, I'll do that. Well, we, as uh, generally as Android, have a, the I think which we've been sharing since the last I/O, the better together um, uh, ecosystem approach that we have. So there's a lot of um, uh, investment and thought going into that area and thinking of uh, TV as becoming the hub of the living room and the house. Um, uh, when, when you think about you know, all of the, uh, the two-phased approach that I mentioned earlier in the discussion in terms of, you know, helping provide uh, the heavy lifting parts of the OS and the ecosystem so it's just delightful experience just works, right? Um, uh, because that needs to be just available as the user is still going to make the price and, uh, you know, TV size decision. Uh, but as that brings the, the cost of the, uh, the, let's call it the TV uh, down, the O OEM, let's say the bet would be the OEMs should uh, invest bad and can invest back into better RAM, uh, better socks, for example, which will elevate this uh, TV as the home of the hub uh, strategy. And then that feeds into all of the, uh, the use cases that you're talking about, right? Uh, social is one of them, use, using it as a camera device, uh, and many more use cases. So yes, we're definitely looking into this, and TV is part of our better together uh, user journey. Very good, and my last question we're going to do is a quick fire question because we are holding these people up from lunch. 20 seconds or less. Tell me what's the next great advance in the TVOS? What's got you excited about what's to come? Uh, Mehmet, you look puzzled, so I'm going to go to you first. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's good that you asked me first. Um, we have been, well, it's not that short term, maybe a bit longer, but I feel like, you know, in our industry, we talk a lot about um, creating value for OEMs, for us, for content partners. But I think we're leaving since the very first day the end consumer out of it so far. So I'm looking into other technologies like decentralization, blockchain, Web3. I think that we will very soon see uh, watch and earn kind of approaches in our industry. Uh, where we basically pay people to watch more TV and give them some of the revenues that we so delightfully share at the moment with OEMs and content partners to have them stay with us for a longer period of time. That's something I would see in the future. Love it. I don't think we're going to be talking about 
big implementations this time next year, but uh, maybe sometime in the future, Farhad? 20 seconds or less, what do you think? Uh, 20 seconds, uh, I'll give a boring answer. I alluded to it earlier in this question as well. Um, I think, uh, you know, with the, the uptick that we are seeing with voice um, and kind of this whole idea of TV becoming a more ambient computing platform within the home, uh, for it to be connected to all devices and kind of be that uh, useful experience in the home just uh, outside of just consumption experience is kind of uh, uh, exciting future to look forward to. Okay, I thought you were gonna say Bard would make the decision for you, but uh, maybe not, maybe not. Nick? We're, we're always good on these panels of talking about all the things we're really good at and th that are great. The, the thing that I think CTV manufacturers are really bad at, um, that I'm kind of passionate about solving is the, is the concept of profile on TV. So, you know, it drives me mad when I turn my TV on and the Netflix recommendations are for, for my son and the Amazon recommendations are for my for daughter and it's, it's me watching the TV. How, how do we get the TV understanding more about who the actual person sitting watching is on a device that's typically shared? And so we're, we're really looking at how we can solve that. I, I, I pick up a remote control every time I turn the TV on. If I do that on my phone, my phone knows who I am. So there are ways of doing this to be smart. So maybe that's a little tease of things to come. But uh, yeah, how, how do we solve the, the profiling conundrum on lean back TV? So it sounds like we need a camera and face recognition so you can tell who's sitting there. Yeah, or thumb, <laughs> thumb on the remote. <laughs> well, there we have it. That's some, some futures for us to all think about. Thank you, Mehmet, Fahad, and Nick. Been a great discussion. Thank you for your attention.